What I know now is that we are in the end of times for the empire, the American empire. And not the end of like the world's not gonna blow up, but end times for the, the empire. And when empires fall, it's usually a very chaotic transition. And there's usually a lot of shit that goes down and um, being in the wrong place at the wrong time um, can absolutely mean the difference between life and death. Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. Today we've got a very special guest. Um, I guess legendary, debauched author, CEO, cattle rancher, Tucker Max. How's it going, buddy? Good. Thank you. I have more sheep than cattle, though. So oh, really? Wow. Uh, those jokes kind of write themselves, so I'll skip them. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so let's uh, let's go back to the beginning. You were We were talking before the show, your grandmother owned uh a beef ranch back in the day or maybe it's still in the family you were 16 you left home uh and i think a lot of people know that a lot of the rest of the story but walk us through you know through college and the books and stuff like that right so i uh, went to boarding school in new jersey blair academy um and then uh uh undergrad university of chicago law school at duke and then uh, i hated i loved law school but hated being a lawyer it's, it's the worst because i have a soul and uh, uh, I got fired uh, two and a half weeks into being a lawyer. And uh, I got fired on a Wednesday. I, I was such a reckless. That story is in my first book. I hope it's ever here now. Yeah. Uh, and I deserved it. Uh, they, 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 they were right to fire me. And anyway, I mean, you, so you, you've got to go out of your way to get fired on a Wednesday, to be honest, because typically the corporate oh, world, yes. everybody waits till Friday, right? <laughs> Dude, of course. It was so, so the big thing was uh, I the like the senior female. Uh, attorney in one of the the big uh, she's like a partner in one of the big divisions proposition like straight up like hey you know come up to my office for whatever and like i turned her down mm. and then i told everyone <laughs> like it was, i was not a smart man at 25 yeah. dude i was i was exceptionally stupid and i still don't know why i turned her down because i've definitely slept with women who are older less attractive everything i don't mm. know what i was thinking every decision was wrong like either sleep with her or shut up or whatever. Right. Um, and so then uh, I got fired. Um, what was the cause of termination father. exactly? What did they put on the paperwork? Oh, I'd done all kinds of other stuff, dude. <laughs> I, I got see. drunk at a firm event. Like I gave them miles of rope <laughs> to hang me. It was, they didn't, I don't remember what they said. It wouldn't have mattered. Um, and so uh, I went to work for my, after graduated law school from Duke and then went to work for my dad. He owned a restaurant company in South Florida. And um, my dad fired me from the family business, although it did take me six months to get fired from my, f by my own father from the family business. Um, so I proved a little bit there. Uh, then um, honestly, I didn't know what to do with my life at that point because, like, I, you know, I went to University of Chicago to study econ and then Duke for law, and like the two things I studied for, I didn't just fail at. I face planted and went through the floor at. And so. Um, um, I had been writing emails to my friends when I was living in Florida because you know, Florida was very different 20 years ago. Uh, it was like um, all old people and uh, all the young people, the few young people that were there were all like on drugs. Mm -hmm. I didn't do drugs. You know, not like, not like people doing drugs now or like medicine and, yeah, yeah. and psychedelic therapy, <clears throat> enlightenment. No, like I'm doing, you know, blow at the club drugs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, like, if you don't do drugs and you're not 75, <laughs> there's like nothing in Florida for you. And so I was writing email. I would get drunk and hook up with, you know, uh, horrible people anyway. But and write emails about it to my friends. And uh, they were hilarious emails. And my buddy called me up and he's like, listen, dude, you know, like, you're not real good at the things you train for. But these emails are the funniest things I've ever read in my life. He's like, you should, this is what you should do. You should, you know, write these stories. And I'm like, be a, what am I going to be a writer? Like I'm some bitch. Like, no, stop it. And he, th th this dude is like, he has a, a pretty famous position now at a big company. But anyway, so he, he's like, well, uh, you, you suck at the things you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> you train for, and this you're good at. So yeah, maybe you are just a bitch. Right. And so, uh, uh, I swallowed my pride. I sent my, like my five best emails to every publishing house in, in the country. Like there was like a thousand or 500, uh, zero 
acceptance, like a hundred percent rejection. You know, like ninety you know, percent didn't even respond, mm-hmm. and then the form letter rejections mostly. Although there were three or four people who took the time to write rejections, like this is the worst shit I've ever read. You shouldn't even write an email again. Like mm-hmm. this is horrible. All that kind of stuff. Um, and because uh, back then uh, the publishing was infected by the woke, even then, twenty mm-hmm. years ago, and so they hated me. But uh, I, I put all my stuff. This was two thousand two. And so I didn't know what to do. And so I put it all up on a website. Uh, I'm like, oh, there's this thing called GeoCities and Yahoo Mm -hmm. and put it all up for free. And I'm like, all right, I guess this is whatever. And then it took off. And um, like College Humor put, you you remember College Humor? They profiled it and it blew up. And then all the, you know, a few months, but all all the publishers came back and wanted to do books. And then so from there came, I hope they serve beer in hell, which was a, you know, New York Times bestseller spent like five, six years on the list. And then there was a movie and sequels and all this stuff. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I guess sometime uh, after the success of the book, you decided to start your own uh, publishing company. I probably, you know, I mean, that, that this is how a lot of um, this is how a lot of businesses get started with, uh, you know, a, a misanthrope who's kind of irritated by the system, still wanting to participate and, uh, you know, kind of making a company to, to do it probably yeah. because you want to do it yourself, but also because, you know, I, I, I find myself very frequently having good ideas for businesses that I simply don't even have time to do. I just want yeah. them to exist so I can use them. So I'm just like, Hey, would you mind? Like, I'll just give somebody an idea. Like, you know, what would be a good idea is this. And then they go start the business. And then I just, I have nothing to do with it. I just buy it. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, but yeah. you, so you started Scribe. How'd, how'd that happen? Man, it, it was um, almost everything I've done well in my life or th- successfully. I've done because other people were like, you, I was too dumb to recognize it myself. And other people forced me into it. Mm. So like with my stories, my buddy almost like kind of made me put those out in the world. I would not have done that on my own. <laughs> Scribe kind of started the same way. I was at this entrepreneur dinner in like 2013 or 2014 and uh this woman asked me basically she asked me how do i write a book without having to go through all the you know work of having to write it mm. and i'm like <laughs> and i'm like are you asking me how to write a book without writing it she's mm. like yeah and i'm like what what a, like what kind of a lazy nitwit are you and i start lecturing this woman about her work it what's funny is like she was a total badass baller like, mm. she's built a bunch of companies and all this stuff and she rolls her eyes out of her fucking head at me and it's like, look, no, no, no. And and she's like, listen, this is an entrepreneur dinner. Are you an entrepreneur or not? I'm like, yeah. She's like, okay, well, entrepreneurs help people solve their problems. Mm-hmm. So are you going to help me solve the problem or are you just going to lecture me about hard work? <laughs> I was like, oh, dude, I got, I got lit. I got angry mm-hmm. because she was right. She called mm-hmm. me out and she was 100% right. I was being an elitist, snobbish douchebag. And so, um, of course, I got obsessed with this, this question. Um, and then I realized, oh, right, like this process has existed for years, N- not ghostwriting, but scribing. Because mm-hmm. she wanted a book that was her ideas, her words. She-, she didn't want a ghostwriter, but she didn't want to have to sit down at a computer all day. And I'm like, oh, I can just interview. As long as I know how to structure a book and I know how to interview you, I can interview you, get the book out. I can, you know, if I set up the process right, I can get it out of you really easily. So we, we decided, named a figure. I didn't even care. I just wanted to get this done to you know, prove to her that like I was less of a douchebag than she probably correctly assumed. And uh, uh, she's like, yeah, sure, that's great. And then we did it and the book was great. And um, she's like, uh, how, you know, wh- what do you charge for this? And I'm like, charge for what? She's like, well, when I send my friends to you, like they're all asking me how I finished my book. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this for your friends. <laughs> like, why would you send your friends to me? That's horrible. And she's like, yeah, what you you can charge them whatever you want. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to. And so, but she, she like sent them anyway. And I, there was a friend of mine, Zach Oberon, who I ended up find, founding the company with. I was like, I knew him pretty well. We we're working on something else. I'm like, look, uh, that wasn't working at all. And I was like, hey, look, dude, uh, can I just give you these clients? I'll tell you exactly what to do. Here's the process, and we'll split the money. And you can. He's like, oh, that's great. That's amazing. And so, what <laughs> one month. We ended up doing like a quarter million dollars mm. uh, from word of mouth. And Zach's like, dude, we have like an actual company, man. I can't just handle this by myself anymore. And uh, and it took off from there. And then I just exited in December of last year. 
um, like I kind of left the company. Uh, but I, when I, I think it's up to 400 employees now. Um, and we've done thousands of books and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. Uh, and at some point during this whole process, uh, found your, found your way back to Texas or to Texas, I guess. Um, and there's, I mean, uh, every, anybody that listens to this show knows there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a, a, a disillusion of, uh, you know, the public trust and in institutions for very good reason. Um, I, I, it's, it's just general societal decay, right? I mean, it's happened in empires far older than ours, um, many, many times over, but for whatever reason, <clears throat> people in the West like to create problems for themselves, I guess. I, I don't know what it is. Um, you know, but we unsolve problems on a, on a, regular basis and it happens very rapidly uh and you've seen this you know kind of unfold around you and i i know we've noticed over the years that uh you know you started hedging for your own family against this stuff uh and now you're yeah. kind of talking about it. you got the new the newest new ish show uh but t tell me about how that worked for you like what made you decide to move back out here to get back into farming and, and not farming, but uh, ranching and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, all right. <laughs> so I moved to, to Texas. I am not part of the recent wave of assholes that are trying to ruin Texas. Yeah. This was like 2013 uh, like, or something. What right. Yeah. 2013. Yeah. So I've been there almost 10 years. Um, so I was part of the, the people, the original group of people that essentially kicked out all the old hipsters from Austin, mm. like <laughs> priced all of them out and they all left and went to wherever the hell they went to. Um, and, uh, uh, te Texas was like very cool. Austin, especially was a very cool city to live mm. in, man. I really liked it. And, um, my wife, you know, I met my wife here. I didn't plan to stay, but I met my wife, girlfriend and now my wife. And, and I just, so many cool people in Austin. And I think it's because, um, at least it used to be pre COVID. I think cause the, the environment in Texas sucks. Like mm. it's it's horrible weirdly like rainy icy cold the winter it's africa hot in the summer everything in the environment here is hot and dusty and pokey and bitey and trying to attack you and, like you look at my i've been clearing brush like it looks like i fought a herd of cats or something and like i don't it's not like i have some horrible place like it's like a normal texas place and so like if you stay in a place like this you know, you can make a, a you, know, you can stay in Miami or California or all these other places. They have beautiful weather and all. You, you have to really want to be here, like because the environment is not keeping you here. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, what what ends up being attracted are like um, people who who want to be here and usually really cool people who are like uh, um, uh, like have their shit together in a lot of ways. And so I realized like I, that was my favorite part of Austin. That's the only reason to be in Austin, and so <clears throat> or in Texas really. And so that was pre-COVID. Then COVID hit, and then the lockdowns, and then all the riots, and all, and then, like you said, shit went nuts. Mm. And I, I was like, I remember a lot. Like I kind of know Alex Jones and that crew a little bit, and um, uh, I remember like pre-COVID, I'm like, okay, you guys have some points maybe about this or that, but mostly you're just crazy. Like yeah. this is this is just nonsense, right? Like just stop it. I get it. You're ginning people up and getting their adrenaline high and selling them supplements and okay, fine, whatever. And then after COVID, I was like, hmm, man, they might have a point. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I still think Alex and a lot of those crew are fucking crazy, mm -hmm. but crazy people can be right sometimes, right? Yeah. And, and, that, and then I started looking around, really looking around and realizing, all right, um, I don't know for sure what is going on. Like Klaus Schwab might be a clownish buffoon or he might be a, a Bond villain come mm. become real. <clears throat> it doesn't actually matter. Like we reached a point mid to late 2020 where I realized it doesn't matter who's doing what. What, what I know now is that we are in the end of times for the empire, the American mm. empire. And not the end of like the world's not gonna blow up, but end times for the the empire. And when empires fall, it's usually a very chaotic transition. And there's usually a lot of shit that goes down. And um, being in the wrong place at the wrong time 
um, can absolutely mean the difference between life and death, right? And mm -hmm. so I was like, all right, um, if we're about to go through a chaotic time, and it could be just, you know, some a lot of prices and a few shortages, or it could be like l low intensity warfare, you know, um, or it could be even way worse than that, then I need to get out of cities, which are death traps mm -hmm. during chaos, during chaos. Uh, so I need to get out of the city. I need to get onto land and I need to uh, be as self-sufficient and resilient and sovereign as possible, right? There's no such thing as living off the grid. That's nonsense. Right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is like, oh, I'm off the grid. I'm like, really? What, what happens when your solar coupler breaks? Oh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. fucking grid. Shut yeah. up. But you can be sovereign. You can be very resilient and be able to survive for long periods of time disconnected from uh, major supply chains. Mm -hmm. And you can be sovereign in a lot of ways. Like we, we, we're water sovereign. Mm -hmm. Like we have a well and then also rainwater capture. Uh, and so like basically barring a major catastrophe, um, like we, should, we were good on water for a long time mm -hmm. and things like that. And so I realized uh, I needed to do that. And then I figured... Texas, I really, we looked at everywhere in, in the country, actually in the world. And I thought, well, I think what's coming, I don't think you can run from. Like, I don't think there's a place, you know, like if you were in uh, whatever, uh, Sri Lanka six months ago, get the hell out of Sri Lanka, right? right? But I think overall what's coming to the world is that I don't think any place is going to be safe from it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so like, uh, it's not going to be like a U.S. civil war where you can go to Canada or you can go mm -hmm. to wherever and it's fine. I think what's coming is worldwide. And I think America is still going to be the best place to be for the next decade. And then I looked within America and I'm like, okay, where in America? And, um, there's a lot of, I mean, that's a, that could be a whole episode you could talk about, but, uh, I, I ended up picking Texas, my wife and I, for a lot of different reasons. But the main one is just the, the two, the two main ones that boil down to one is if shit gets real bad. Um, we are energy sovereign, mm -hmm. like, and I mean actual petroleum, which is the only real reliable energy source still. Right. And uh, and then also uh, we have a lot, a long history in the political will in the people, even though the the dominant Republican Party, you can argue differently, but the people to be um, an independent or quasi independent mm -hmm. state for at least ex an extended period of time, and um, and then actually the only state that can legally uh, in its deal with the U.S. can actually vote on that, which mm -hmm. to the extent that politics matters. And so like, okay, we're going to be in Texas. So where do we want to be? Looked around um, uh, and like found an amazing community in Driven. Mm -hmm. And we moved out here. And then a bunch of my friends and people I know moved out here. So we've ended up starting a school that's really close, like a, a Waldorf style school mm -hmm. and building a couple other community things out here. Um, and it's a lot of really good people. And so now I'm in a situation where, I mean, I only have 45 acres, so it's not like, you know, uh, it's that huge, but I get 90%, we're about 80 to 90% of our meat. We source either from this ranch or from neighbors, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, all our water. Um, and then like we, you know, if, if things were bad for extended periods of time, we'd be in a pretty good situation. Um, both, you know, defense, water, food, energy, you know, like I've backup systems, all kinds of other stuff. And then the important part, though, people don't realize is community. Like you can have all this 10 years of food stored up and all the gas in the world. But like if you don't have a group of people who are there to help you with a lot of things, namely if things get really bad with defense, then it's not yours. Right. And, and the community out here both are great now. And I think if things got a lot worse would would be in a good position as well. And so um, now things may not get that bad, right? A lot of people are like, well, what if nothing you know, terrible happens? I'm like, okay, great. Then I overspent a little bit on ammo <laughs> and I, I probably don't need as many generators as I have, but I live in this amazing ranch and my kids are growing up like raising sheep and chickens and cows and we have this amazing food. And it's like, that's, that's a good scenario too. You know, like, uh, and, and if things go bad, then, you know, no one's, foolproof survival proof i can survive anything but we're in a pretty good situation so <clears throat> famously uh ben franklin warned people to not trade their uh liberty for security right yep. but I, I feel like we've traded our liberty for convenience not security which is a yes. far dumber thing to do to be honest <laughs> i mean yes. uh you like you essentially you get nothing of any real value out of that you just 
get lazier and stupider. Yeah, right? totally. hundred percent. And it, it's like fast food. You know, you can't, you can say all the things you want about fast food. You cannot say it doesn't taste good in the moment mm -hmm. when you are putting it in, because it's literally engineered to taste really well, right. really good. But like um, everything else about it is uh, is pretty disastrous, right? After you're done eating, convenience is the same same way. In the moment, it feels amazing, but you're not paying the full price in the moment. Exactly, and that that brings uh, back something you said before about you know having to work the land. I guess uh, maybe that's reductive, but d just let, let's use that as an example. Having to work the land is uh, there's something about. Well, there's two, there's two parts here. One, there's something about hard work putting into making your area per, an impermissible area permissible for yourself and your family that causes lazy assholes, uh, weak people to self-select out of that system. That's one. That's a good thing. Uh, yes. Two, you know, you're not sacrificing liberty for convenience and security at that point, which is a, is a, another huge thing. And then and obviously the, the result of all this is that human beings get back to doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is working and, and there being a very specific ratio of work to benefit, right? That's a really important thing for our brains because if you look at the science behind how, how good and bad habits are created, right? It takes a lot longer to unmake a bad habit. Uh, and it takes a lot, it, it's very quick to make a bad habit, 21 days maybe. And it takes at a minimum 10 weeks to undo that or to create a new good habit. So what we know about that math, I mean, let's just call that biological math. What we know is that, uh, you know, it requires quite a bit of effort to, to ensure that things go the right way. And it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is what it is. Right. So pretending like that doesn't exist is stupid, <clears throat> but it's also stupid to think, that we can go out of our way to make our lives more convenient and that that be a net positive for society. I mean, that's that's really myopic. Well, I mean, yes, um, there is a level at which, though, like, you know, I enjoy the convenience of. OK, so today I've been like literally two hours before this podcast, I was um, splitting wood. Right. And like, man, in Texas, I didn't under used to understand why people used um, uh, you know, a hydraulic log, oh, log splitter. splitter. Yeah, yeah. Right, because I'm like, come on, how hard can it, like, just take the mall, the mall and split the goddamn, and it's like a good workout. What's wrong? Yeah. Bro, I didn't, man, in Texas, the way these fucking oaks grow and everything, <laughs> you can't get a straight piece to split, man. Yeah. And with all the knots in it, mm -hmm. you can't cut your way through that. Yep. So I got here, I'm like, oh, now I get, so I'll be honest with you, man. I am really kind of stoked. <laughs> that uh, I have the convenience of a hydraulic log splitter as opposed to having to somehow do this shit myself, which I'm not, and I know how to split wood. I'm not sure mm. how I would split a lot of this but stuff. But there's right? a diminishing return on that, right? Because if you take, course, if, you, if you go to the next step and buy your wood from somebody else, then when you need wood and that person doesn't exist anymore or the sale of wood is regulated, now you're fucked, right? Yeah, 100%. But it's, here, I think the thing isn't uh, convenience or no convenience. Mm. It's are you as a person doing uh, uh working on things that matter to you that you are connected to that you own a part of um uh, and, and that are beneficial on net right sure. so like um because uh, convenience is a balance in that but dude it is one thing man i have not i haven't i understood intellectually this but i because you know i'm an entrepreneur I, 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 writer and entrepreneur you're a writer you work on your own books entrepreneur you work on your own company dude it is a fundamentally different thing to work on your own land because like you know even a book you write a book yeah it's there forever but it's i don't want to say it's not real but it's ephemeral mm -hmm. right and a company is really just an idea right and it is a story that everyone a bunch of people will rally behind or not but your land, like, you know, I, I uh, put up some fence, which was so much harder than I could have ever imagined uh, uh, it was. But putting up fence is quite hard mm -hmm. until you learn what you're doing. But um, uh, put up some fence and it's like, ah, oh, dude, it was so miserable doing it. And I had to learn it. And I felt so stupid because I'm like, idiots do this and I can't figure it out. Like, mm -hmm. What is going on? But I figured I got, but, and it's like, I'm like super proud of this fence, mm. like really irrationally proud, uh, not just proud of the fence, but then also I did a good job. It's going to be there a long time. Mm. Like the, 
my kids and probably if we're still here, my grandkids will be able to use that fence. And so it's like, whereas like most things people do, how meaningful and lasting and truly and uh, relevant to your own li to their lives are you? I mean, you know, most people spend their lives doing bullshit work for somebody else, literally. right? For somebody else, yeah. and it's like, well, okay, if, that, if you like that, that's cool, awesome. But I don't, mm. you know, that's just not my thing. Well, when you were describing, you know, your your previous work, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, I, I want to ask why you think you failed at those jobs, but it's pretty clear, right? It's it's purpose i'm sure you were like i was and a lot of other people before i found the, my real purpose pretty nihilistic about the work you were doing you know what i mean it was like something to do it was what you're supposed to do you're on schedule doing it you graduated with a good degree so you need to do it it pays the bills whatever you know a little platitude you tell yourself to make it okay during the day but inside somewhere you know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing and, and that, that's, a, that's a big it, problem right it's a huge one when i was young that uh, like when i got fired I didn't have either the self-awareness or the courage to quit. Like I should have quit law school. Uh, I should have gone to law school. And then when I got there, I knew, man, mm. I knew a week into law school, like nothing against law. Like if you're seriously like one of those people who are into the law and you want to, you know, like justice and all that kind of mm. stuff, that's great. That was not me. Like I was at law school because it was a high status thing to do where I thought I could make a lot of money quickly. Mm. And people told me I should do it. Like, I come on, man. And so, like, that's just the truth. And and um and I was not honest or self aware or connected enough with myself to realize, um, I shouldn't be there. Mm. And quite honestly, I was too afraid to quit because it was like, okay, I'm there. I'm doing this high status thing. Do I want to say I went to Duke Law School and quit? I was too afraid. I was a coward, mm. uh, about, truly. And then I got, I got to a law firm, and it was ten times worse, man. It's like. It's like being at the county jail versus man prison, right? <laughs> like, the, like law school's a county jail. It's like, all right, you can deal with that. I went to man prison, man. That's what being a lawyer is. Don't let them ever tell you it's any different. You you may have golden handcuffs on, but they are handcuffs. Right. And and so what I ended up doing was all getting drunk and acting out and this and that was my, uh, that was my way of making the decision I was too much of a coward to make consciously. Mm. Like I forced them to fire me instead of ex swallowing the pill of truth that I had made the wrong decision by going to law school. And the thing I needed to do was get out of that profession now. Sure. Yeah. That's the truth. And I think that's uh, that's a pretty common thing and it stunts all of our personal growth. And I think we should have had this conversation about American politics probably about 40 years ago. Right. Um, before before things really started to to unravel. And you, you spoke earlier about the end of the American empire. I would say uh, the original American empire, that's correct. But if you remember, Rome rose and fell for multiple times from Romulus no, 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 and the no, kings. No, no, hold on. There's an empire, there's a republic in the empire. Sure. Like the, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so America. there was the original empire of Rome under Romulus. And then he, the last king was deposed. The Senate right. came about and then the empire came back with Augustus and then, you know, the empire died again. So they went through transitions there. And I think um, this is a major inflection point. Like America is in the process right now of deciding and it's going to get rough for a while. And they're, they're in the we're, we are in the process of deciding what kind of world we want to live in, in the future, whether it's going to be an autonomous one where we control our own destiny or whether we're going to allow ourselves to be surrendered to this like globalist agenda. And I, to be honest, it doesn't seem like we're winning that fight. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I uh, I would say right now, uh, we're definitely down on this, hundred mm -hmm. <laughs> percent. Like, uh, but I feel like um, you know that you know the famous meme. Of, yeah, they had us in the first half. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like we're we're coming up on that moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if we haven't already had it, um, then we're coming up on it. Um, uh, yeah. I'm definitely, man, like, I, I, I like that there's a group of us that call ourselves Doomer Optimists because mm. it's like, on one hand, it's like, okay, the shit is hitting the fan. Like, this is legit. But then on the other hand, I'm like, man, if we do our work, I think we're going to be okay. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah I mean, and, it's just and, like the Doomer Optimist thing I actually like. I've, I've heard you talk about this before, and I am 100% in agreement with that What for a number of reasons. One, I'm completely prepared to do without all of this stuff because I've done without it before. I've been in very austere environments before. Um, yeah. But also... 
it's it's not a matter of America collapsing necessarily. It's the institutions inside of it that make our lives a little bit easier collapsing. You know, that's what it really yeah, so I think, I think that, that ship sailed, man. Yeah. If you're, not- but if you're willing to if you're if you're willing and capable of persisting without, you know, uh, uh, a solid currency or, you know, all of these factories and all this other bullshit that exist in, in international trade. It's pretty yeah, hold on. Factories existing and American institutions, those two things do not have to go together. Oh no, certainly not. No. It, it, it's so the you know, we reduce things like that because like, oh, America is doing this or America is doing that. Well, America is a big ass place. There's three hundred fifty million people here. And I live in Texas. So, you know, I'm not too concerned about all this stuff that's going on. I'm concerned for my country, generally speaking, but I'm not concerned for my own welfare at all. Okay, I, I'll just say, it, man, the way I see it, mm. I, I grieved for our country um, about a whatever it was a year and a half ago. Um, like the moment where I, it was obvious to me that, and it, even though it happened a long time ago, I didn't believe it. Where I saw, oh man, the the republic has fallen, mm. and we are we're now we're now an empire. Sure, and yeah. In a lot of ways. Um, at least from the perspective of people, a lot of people around the world and a justifiable perspective, we're the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Like we've been the bad guys in a lot of situations, right? Maybe not you and I or individually, but like the American foreign policy mm-hmm. apparatus, right? And um, uh, uh, I, I think I have accepted the fact that America, as as we understood it when we were, we're about the same age as we understood yep. it when we were growing up, is gone. Yep. And it, and it's not coming back and something is going to replace it. And, and that is the open question. And that is the thing that I'm I'm working on and not even man. I, you know, it's the weirdest thing as I'm not worried about. I'm not doing any of this for America. Mm-hmm. I, I think I almost, I'm a this is good. I hope this doesn't sound like uh, anti-American because it's not. That's not how I am at all. But on the, on the same, I feel like the corrupted in the, the institutions that we now see are very corrupt sure. rotten from the floor, yeah. and have been that way for at least you know a few decades if not much longer um i think they've used the lever of patriotism to get to a lot of really good well-meaning people to do some uh, uh messed up stuff yeah i was one of them you know I, yeah. I i went to some stupid wars for no apparent reason so yeah i know what you're talking but, about uh, Right. So, so all, a lot of my friends who mm. spent a lot of time and spilled a lot of blood in the GWAT, uh, mm. all say that, or almost all of them say that. And so, um, uh, I, I'm a, it has not been articulated by anyone, definitely not by me, but, um, I think something, the idea of America that we had growing up, I think is going to reform, uh, in a new way. And I, I'm not sure whether it will be called America or have a different name or how it's going to go. But but to me, we actually have an opportunity mm-hmm. right now um, to as individuals and, you know, as a group to redefine what we want the American story to be. Right. And, and going forward, because like the American story, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago was great and it, it worked really well for a long, long time. Um, and it creates some beautiful, amazing results in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, negatives were there, but uh, uh, but uh, I think we have an opportunity. The corruption and, and the rot are horrible, but it's like you know sometimes you got to have a collapse to to be able uh, you know a death to have a rebirth. You know, and I think um, I think we are at the very beginning of that um, of people waking up to that and understanding that. And um, for me, I'm not actually worried. So the question then becomes, wh- how do you do that? What do you, I've tried as much as I can not to talk about we, like, oh, we gotta do this, we gotta do that mm-hmm. and make it like a broad thing instead. Like I'm trying to focus on what I do, what my family does mm-hmm. and what, what I am doing in my community. Yeah, yeah. Like that's it. Yeah. You know, and, and not divorced from, it's part of America and it's part of a te- part of Texas, which is part of America. And, and those things matter. Sure. But to me, like Texas matters. I, I'm just going to make up random numbers. Texas matters 15 percent and America matters 5 percent. And my community and my family matter 80 percent, at right. least of what I do. And I think if all of us did, there are a lot of us did that. I think um, 
uh, we probably wouldn't have all the rotted, corrupting institutions. That, sure. You know, I mean, think about um, you've got a, a slightly sprained right ankle and you start you continue to perform and you start favoring it. And now you've got uh, a torn meniscus in your left knee sure. right from that. When in, in any piece of machinery, when uh, the parts don't fundamentally serve intently their own purpose first before anything else, then the entire machine will break down. That That's just a, a fundamental law of nature. And I think uh, what you're talking about is federalism, right? It's the, the idea that, sure, we're going to we're gonna mount a common defense. But aside from that, we reduce power to the lowest possible level because that's where power is most powerful. It's where it works. It's where it's most efficient. And no system of government scales indefinitely, even federalism, right? Because at some point, because of the common power at the top, bad actors, predators, whomever, are going to try to get wedge themselves in there and take control of that. That's just how that works. Well, I, I, it, what I'm talking about is basically federalism mm. from a political angle. But um, yes, that that's the result of what mm. I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, though, is honestly personal responsibility. Sure. Um, like uh, the thing cause you see it on Twitter, man. like. Go look on Twitter and look how many people, when discussing any political issue, say we. <laughs> right? And the thing I always say to people is, there is no we. There is only a you. Right? And well, it's so funny. I, I, <laughs> I did that. And this, God bless autists. Because this, like, uh, this autistic girl was like, literally started giving me a definition of we and explaining the epistemological sense of a group of people. I'm like, okay, I understand that a group of people can exist. Stop it. What I mean is that if you're talking about any sort of, and you can pick a political issue, um, we is not where problems are dealt with. Hmm. We is not where people live. It is not how decisions are made. I, what you do is where, and local is where, right? That's where things happen. And so like, that's why I've been, it's why I bought land. It's why I focus so much. Dude, it's a huge reason why I'm the one doing all the work on this ranch. It's not because I have to. It'd be way faster and more efficient if I hired good people who've been doing this for years here. Mm. But the, I want to learn this. I want to know my land. I want to become part of it by doing the work on it, right? Um, and and uh, if, I, if I'm a believer that people should, that, that responsibility is the key to freedom and the key to sovereignty, I mean, if I just had a plumber, or I had just workmen here all day doing everything, and it wasn't me splitting this wood, it was somebody else, then that would just be bullshit. Yeah, correct. Yeah. You know? and, and it's, I mean, yeah, what you're describing is the purpose, the reason I, I started this show. So it's like the, the dichotomy between citizen and subject, I think, is one that's been very interesting over the years in America and other uh, forms of government. Um, my... The, the Cornell law definition of a citizen is a person who by place of birth nationality of one or both parents or naturalization has granted full rights and responsibilities as a member of a nation <clears throat> or political community. Notice it says rights and responsibilities. It's not my rights, my rights all the time. The, this idea that one, that rights are granted to you, which is absolute nonsense, or two, uh, that that is the primary focus goes part and parcel with this whole self-care me uh, mental health day culture that we're in these days where uh, there's an expectation of result instead of the expectation that work produces results right so i don't want to hear you talk about your rights unless you're performing your responsibilities because you can either whine about your rights and beg for the nanny state to grant them to you and you will be a subject of that empire right of that kingdom or you will be a citizen who understands that your responsibility is to do these things at the lowest possible level, not just for yourself or for right now, but for all of us and permanently. Like if you want to talk about we and us, you are doing your part. You know what I mean? It's like the log drill in, in buds. So I'm sure you have plenty of Navy SEAL friends. Yeah, no, I've seen the, the thing where you guys have to lift the log together and like you know one person can lift the log and all that yeah, stuff, Yeah, it's right? like a – well, one of them is I, – I, I was in the Army. I wasn't in the Navy, but uh, you, you can hear these guys talking about it. There's one uh, that's – like 400 pounds, right? And you'll have five, 10, 12 dudes holding it up, doing presses over their heads and stuff. And if any individual stops doing their individual part, then everybody fails. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, th this is true 
<laughs> and everything that we understand and, 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 and sociology and psychology and government and, and like f even to physical mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. And a machine, any, anytime any of this stuff breaks down, then the system itself breaks down. And for some reason, I don't understand fully why it is. I don't know if it's, I like Hanlon's razor. It's like, don't imply malice when incompetence will suffice. I, I, I try to apply that a lot because I am a skeptic, but I don't want to become a cynic. But why do we always try to solve problems as far downstream as possible? Because that doesn't make any sense. It's it's like the pharmaceutical industry. I understand why they do it because treating a cure or treating a symptom forever is better than curing a uh, disease. But yeah. when we're trying to solve problems for ourselves personally or when we're trying to solve problems as a society no. or community or whatever, we go way downstream instead of going upstream and solving yeah. the impetus. It, it, most people want to treat the symptoms and not the causes. Right. I'll tell you why. I think there's two reasons. And just from my own experience. One is that causes can be very complex and difficult to understand. Not impossible, but you, mm. you got to do work to figure out a cause, whereas a symptom's obvious. Like, mm. oh, I've got, you know, I'm bleeding on the finger. I need to treat that. Okay, why? Well, you know, like I was in a knife fight. <laughs> why was I in the cause of the knife fight? It's a very harder thing to deal with than a cut on the on the hand, right? So uh, it's more complex and, and most people obviously will t take the easier road if they can. But then also usually, and I know this for me, every time I start looking for causes, almost inevitably, I've got to really embrace <laughs> myself oh, and my issues. Look, it's the result problems. of my own decisions once again. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right, that's another famous yeah. thing. Well, well, yeah. well, what do yeah. we have here? Yeah. The result of my decision. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and no, who wants to face that, man? Like, I don't, bro, it's like, I don't do psychedelic medicine because it's fun, because I like getting high. Mm. I do it because it's the best way I've found for me to, to kind of deal with my issues. And dealing with your, like, it's not a fun thing to to stop running from emotions you've been running from for mm. years and turn and face them. I don't want to feel grief or sadness or shame or uh, look at, oh, man, look at the, deal with this decision you made and the result that god damn i i fucking hurt that person mm. that was so fucked up yeah. or whatever right like that's not fun that's horrible now the other side of it is, of that responsibility is freedom is mm. that's actual freedom and actual um uh, uh, joy and contentment and all that yeah if Maybe there's one true statement in the here. bible it's that the truth will set you free there's no question about that yeah, but it'll kick your ass before you get there. Well, I think uh, uh, Bring Me the Horizon said that before the truth will set you free, it'll piss you off, I believe is the phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah and it's, you know, it's hard to deal with these things. And I think people get romantic about stuff as well. Like part of it is certainly the shame and discomfort or the, the lack of tolerance for discomfort. Uh, but I think we're also super romantic about the idea of like America. And I, it, to me, it is a misunderstanding of what America is fundamentally. America is not a geographical location. I mean, it's changed in geographical location over the years. It's not, um, it's certainly not our government. It's not p the politicians. It's not either political party. It's none of that bullshit. It's the idea that individual liberty is the primary right of all human beings. And it comes with it, the, the, responsibility to secure that right not just for you but for everybody around you right and that you can defend an idea anywhere at any time you can't defend like if you align yourself with political parties for example then you get put into this position uh where you're defending your political party because you think they're better and you want them to win well that's fucking stupid man that doesn't make any but, sense then you're in a cult that's just a yeah. dogma you're in a cult now yeah I, I will never defend a group over truth ever. right so it's like the idea of these extremely flawed men and women to some degree, but mostly men who, you know, were huge fans of one side of the Greek house or another, right? I mean, Jefferson was more of a, of a party guy, I guess, if you want to call it that, or a hedonist, uh, the rest of the guys, well, George Washington was more of a Catonian, but, um, you know, learning from ancient philosophy and then applying it to modern civilization like the french revolution that came after our revolution and stuff like that the idea of individual liberty right the ability to go about your life go about your family's life i guess unmolested 
by bad actor powers or not even necessarily bad actors, but people who are just trying to impose their will on you is something that America felt very strongly about, right? That's we're the first people to put that down on paper and say, basically, fuck off, right? Like it's, this is you, each individual citizen in this country. And we, by the way, the, the, the definition of who is and isn't a citizen has changed over time as well. Uh, but the idea of what the rights of the citizen are have not changed. And to me, that's like, if you're, if I'm doing land navigation, I'm trying to find a large geographical object. Like if you drop me in the middle of nowhere with a map, I can probably find out where I am just by finding a hillside or a mountain and then orienting myself from there. And I, it's because that thing doesn't move. It's big, it's obvious, and it doesn't move. And that's what we, that's where you fucking build. You build on that. You don't build on this ephemeral quicksand bullshit, you know, that comes and goes. The, so the, it's your uh, assistant or, or a program director sent me mm. the list of things like for sentences. Mm -hmm. like, you know, and um, so, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in in m many of the principles of the founding of America and the American story and all that. But like there's always been an inherent contradiction at the core of, of even America, although America, I think, dealt with this contradiction better than any other country in history. It's still not gone because the contradiction is that. Um, that. A social contract is not actually a contract unless I can opt out. Right. Right. And the way that the social contract is applied in America is not opt out. And it has never been opt out. Mm -hmm. and, and if you want to argue that, then go just on Wikipedia, go look up the history of the Whiskey Rebellion. Oh, yeah. George fucking Washington. Right. So like, like I, I get in an argument one day with, you know, when did the American Republic fall? And I'm like talking in the you know 20th century and uh, Clay Martin goes whiskey rebellion. And I was like, oh, fuck, man, you might be right. <laughs> like, uh, and so like uh, I am not a believer in any contract that I don't have the ability to that I, I first have to knowingly opt into and then have the ability to opt out of. Right. And so like that's where things get really sideways for me and that's where i i because if i can't opt out then everything's politics then now we're just arguing over like who what should wh what is my obligation to this person or that person mm. i i don't feel like i should have to argue with that like i like it, my sovereignty is mine my liberty is mine and yeah, I can enter into an agree. Like we can agree to, you know, live in the same neighborhood and then I got to cut my grass or whatever. Cool. If I agree to it, then that's on me. But like, I, like the way our government operates and has operated forever is really not truly in line with those principles. And, and I understand that there's a lot of difficulty with that. That it's not an easy thing to implement, but let's not pretend that that's not there. Mm -hmm. Right? Like uh, that, because it is. And that, to me, that is the best argument for local um, is that um, states, not just states, but m localities, yeah, yeah. city states, municipalities, uh, if they have to compete against each other for the best people, well, the same way that companies have to compete yeah, for yeah. culture, that's or the... for, for, for customers, that's the only way you're going to have liberty and sovereignty, that's, at least right now. That's the point of federalism, though, right? It's just we've never actually... It was functionally implemented when the West was unsettled, I guess. But yeah, sort of. a, like after that, once there were actual governments in charge, uh, no. you know, yeah. federalism has not been applied. It's it's been applied selectively, I would say, or or through definitely World War One. World War One broke the back of all, uh, and, and World War Two without a doubt. Yeah, like broke the back of all any any real arguments for state sovereignty like the defense production act for example where First. you know they can force you as a private citizen into something um mm -hmm. because they decided to go to war like look i'm not going to argue over whether world war ii was necessary or not i think it was pretty clear we should have been involved quite a bit sooner than we than we actually were but the last let's see since then every single war we've been in was fucked right and uh now even, even today when we're not technically in an, uh, in a hot war, we're still seeing things like a massive hurricane fucks up Florida and people are bickering over, you know, taking care of that area while we're sending hundreds of billions of dollars to a foreign conflict. That doesn't sit well with me. 
Dude, I, it is. What have we spent? Sent like a hundred billion dollars to Ukraine? It's so crim. I mean, this is this is some of the most preposterous mm. theft, organized crime I've ever seen in my life. Like, this is insane. Yeah. But the but the so for there's two things you need for uh, an autocracy. One is you need a lack of federalism or whatever, however you want to define the, the, uh, you know, the bottom up power structure. And then two, the state has to have a monopoly on violence. And I think the only reason that a lot of the, the reason that I have the most hope is because everybody here has guns. You know what I mean? And it gives people pause. Even foreign leaders in the past have animated that. No, we're not going to launch a ground invasion. Yeah, like, fuck that. That We're not doing that. Uh, And then when people are talking about China and stuff, I'm like, I don't care about China. They're not coming over here, man. Like, our Navy and Air Force are better than theirs. And even if it wasn't, they're not sending ground troops into America. That would be a fucking bad day. That'd be a super (laughs) bad day. I mean, think about the Western settlers coming here and fighting the natives. It took a fucking hundred years to fight people that didn't even have guns until we gave them to them. You know what I mean? Bro, like I, I, I live in Dripping. The house next door is one of the original houses that was in this area. Like the first person to live there was killed by Comanches. Yeah. Scalp. Yeah. Like it's part of like historical record. Yeah. They were no joke, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, like I'm not I'm not terribly concerned about anything like that. But anyways, the point of it is, we have we we have the natural defense. But it's only that's only part of the natural defense, right? The the arm the the other part of it is preparedness. You can have all the equipment you need, but if you don't know how to operate it, you're fucked. And that and that, when I say equipment, I don't just mean weapons. I mean the stuff you need day to day to stay alive: food, water, medicine. And it's something that you've been doing quite a bit. As a matter of fact, you're doing quite a few shows on it uh, lately, <sighs> talking to people about self defense. Um, what how to defend what one of your recent episodes is how to do with clay martin by the way is uh when how to defend your family during civil unrest uh you know if you've got if you're hoarding resources and you're not securing the area all you're doing is collecting stuff for me to come take from you basically let's be real about that you know what i mean so i mean it's a pretty it's none of this stuff is all that complicated to be honest and you that you talked earlier about community why why it's important to have and be active in your community like that it they you know shared resources collective defense certainly but it also means you're, you're creating standoff you're making your little piece of the pie bigger so it's harder for some group to come in and infiltrate it which means your the people in your community aren't turning against you because of lack of resources because you guys have built a plan together and when somebody shows up trying to start shit now we've got a collective defense plan as well you know what i mean Yep. This is how we behave in the military, by the way. This is classic paramilitary structure. It's nothing new. This has been going on since fucking 6,000 BC with the Chinese. Yep. Oh, yeah. No, you know, it's funny, man. I always try. I've been trying to explain this to people for years. We all pay protection money to a gang of men with guns. Mm. The only question is which gang of men. You know, like it. you can pay to a mafia. You can pay to a gang. You can pay the U.S. government, which is a gang. And that's not a gang of men with guns. I'm like, don't pay your property taxes. What happens? Mm -hmm. Literally men with guns show up and take your shit, right? Um, Or you can buy your own shit and band together with your neighbors and you are your own gang, right? Now, in certain cases, they're not mutually exclusive. Like, you know, like you can have multiple different types of gangs, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But the idea that... I think, honestly, man, the, the, the hard reality, because this was true even for me, even though I, intellectually I knew this wasn't true, I, it, it took the last two, two and a half years to wake me up to the, the ground truth of this. The world is a dangerous and unsafe place. And America has been so safe and so abundant for so long that we have forgotten the hard reality. You know, it's like, it's funny, man. It's like, um, Oh, dude, uh, what's what's the movie with um, Tom Cruise and uh, Jack Nicholson? The famous one. You can't. You, you, I want oh the yeah, truth. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a few good men. Yeah. A few good men. <clears throat> I remember growing up. I'm like, oh, Jack Nicholson is clearly the bad guy. Tom Cruise is clearly right. And now I'm like, 
Ooh, it's a lot more complicated than I realized, you know, because like, you know, in a safe, abundant world, this mm. is a different question. We're coming out of that world. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, things haven't gotten totally sideways yet, and they might not, hopefully. But but nonetheless, uh, like I have woken up and a lot of pe other people have to the reality of the fact that if you are not equipped and ready and able and willing to defend yourself and your stuff and your community, um however you want to define community whether it's like all, me and all my neighbors me and my county me and my state me and my nation um uh from people who are coming to take your shit mm. and um because we honestly as americans we have not had to think about the only people who had to think about that really were a few people in some pretty poor areas and then people like you who decided i'm gonna go in the military and i'm gonna go find a fight right mm -hmm. and and so obviously like you got to deal with violence then you go to places where that's like but like i was in the military like i didn't ever have to do that right now i'm like oh shit man like it's like i it's funny man you, you can read anything from history and most everyone in history hardly even has to write about this because it's such a part of life that it's like you don't worry about it we things got so fat and happy and convenient like you said that we we forgot we forgot yeah. what the, the default state of the world is. Sure. And I think, uh, you know, something maybe we should keep in mind, although I assume that people have gone through this in the past, have probably tried the same and it's maybe there's no point, but try to in the new system we build, maybe have some kind of reminder of why we, you know, had to solve these problems yet again. Maybe, I don't know, the Hunger Games or something, you know. 75 years of making children fight to the death might work. But um, <clears throat> now I always wonder to your point, if this is just a function of nature, like I, you've, you've heard the, the soft times make hard men or I'm sorry, soft times make hard times or soft men make hard times, blah, 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 that whole thing. Yeah. I wonder if it's not just a function of nature. Like it's no coincidence that seeds fall from a tree pretty much at the exact time they need to, to get fertilized and grow into new trees. It's kind of like just the cycle of nature. And I wonder if I, I, I really want to look into this at some point when I have more time to do some academic research, but have there been periods in history where a lot of super tough people have gone through a lot of super tough shit right at the same time when society was kind of collapsing around them and then they were prepared to fight back when shit started to get wild you know what i mean because it, it's to me it's it's no coincidence that <clears throat> an entire generation of people there's thousands of people like me that yeah. served through this GWAT and then got involved in both philosophy and politics afterwards to understand because i i think maybe we could feel it that things were slipping through our fingers or like, I've got to stop this. And uh, I, I wonder if that isn't some function of nature where it's not just, it's not just, you know, how society reacts to tough times or weak men, but it's just, that's how it is, right? Like this is, maybe this is what Jefferson meant when he said the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. You know what I mean? That these times are going to come, so be ready for it. His, I'm a big believer in historical cycles. Mm. I mean, like, if you actually look at it, it, it would take, you have to be as, the only people stupid enough to not believe in cycles are academics. <laughs> Everyone else is like, oh yeah, everything runs in cycles. All, I mean, if you understand basic physics, mm. energy is like, energy is literally a cycle, yeah, right? Yeah. And if you understand like basic physics, mm. everything is energy. Like matter is just slow down energy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Then of course, and, 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 and like you start really looking at, at, um, at history, you study it. I mean, I'm sure you've read the fourth turning. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of people who are really smart, who've done a ton of stuff around cycles, like Martin Armstrong and Brian Ramelli. And you go down the list of, there's a bunch of Russians too, that, that when, um, uh, I think we're just in a, a, a we're in a certain period of history. And I think you're right, man. I think it absolutely runs in cycles. I think most of the cycles are longer than human lives. So we don't really remember most sure. of it because it's like generational stuff, right? Um, but like, uh, I'm a big believer. I think it's like, I, exactly um, uh, what's happening. And I think we're just at like an empire collapse scenario. And I think 
there's a lot of ways the details can go a lot of different ways but basically like the you know when the tide's going out it's going out and when it's coming in it's coming in and and there's a lot of details that can be different about that depending on different factors but you know the tide's coming out right now and um yeah, it's just time. It's what we got to deal with. I, you're, I, I think we are in a great position in America. Mm. Everyone still has guns. We have a whole generation of men and women who uh, went to fight a stupid, useless war, and they realize it, and they come back with all those skills and awake to the bullshit. Yep. And it's like, so it's like, yeah, like I think we're in a great position. That if if America, on the whole, whatever America becomes in the next decade. If we don't at least have most of America in a better position in 10 years than we are now on net, I'll be shocked. Yeah. I, I think we really, really can't. And, and that better, I don't necessarily mean richer. We may not be in a lot of ways, but like to me, like I spend all, by better, I mean um, more content. I mm. spend almost all my time now outside with my kids, my wife my animals like i have a life that quite honestly i would have thought was boring and shitty when i was 25 mm. i was just like but now it's amazing and i love it um i i think we're we're gonna be i think as a group especially the people who wake up and who do their work are gonna come out of this really well we'll How do, see them yeah i mean we'll see i wonder if uh you know there's a lot of people in this country there's a lot that aren't gonna select into that process <laughs> um but as institutions fall and collapse and this has happened in, in other countries before ours a long, long time ago. But as these institutions collapse, we kind of have a tendency as a species to to fall back into uh, feudalism, right? Where there are the people who prepared over the generations or made hard decisions, and they're now prepared to withstand things. And now they pretty much take on the rest of the community as, uh, I mean, effectively it's subjects, but... Uh, you yes. know, uh, it, it's warlords. Yeah. The word I would use is warlords, but yes, exactly. in, in America, it might be a warlord, but back in like England, it was warden or governor or whatever. Right. So, uh, you know, uh -huh. uh, uh, or, or as in, in some cases, sheriff it depends, but yeah, it's like, um, maybe that's just how it is. You know what I mean? Uh, and in chaos, I mean, what people, what do people look for in chaos? Yeah, leadership, stability, and yeah. Security. Yeah. stability and security. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, choose who you want to be, I guess. This is life is the ultimate choose your own adventure. So, um, uh, no, nobody will be able to affect your life any more than you can. Uh, uh, and that's something that I encourage people to get involved in. Um, tell people about the show that you're doing. Uh, man, honestly, like, it, it's just, um, I, I stopped writing. Uh, yeah, I, I went through the whole thing with like writing, drinking and hooking up and all that. And it was super fun for like, you know, seven, eight years. And then it was like, ugh, I'm ready to move on. And so I retired from that. And I haven't, quite honestly, the God's honest truth is a lot of fame left a bitter taste in my mouth, mostly for my own my own fault. It's not, I don't blame anyone else. But um, uh, it's taken me a while to get past, to deal with all that and get past all that. And so what I, I want to start doing again, what I, I am doing is just two things. I'm writing about my experiences. And and so two types of content. One is like, um, okay, here's what I've learned, right? Like, you know, like here's my, here's my self-defense system. Here's who I talk to. Here's what I learned from them. Here's, you know, here's whatever. I'm about to do a big one about being on a ranch for a year. Mm -hmm. Here's everything I figured out and learned. Here's what worked for me, what didn't. And then the other uh, sort of stuff, which I haven't started yet, but uh, or I haven't put out yet, but I've got a lot of stuff on is, how did I go from that dude, the hope to serve beer and hell guy to this guy? Mm. It's like the thing, the questions I get from people most of the time are, are that, like, how did you go through this transition? Like, how did you, cause like, I wasn't just, you know, like guy who drank and hooked up and party. A lot of people did that. I was kind of like the iconic dude of that for a certain period mm. in a certain generation, even though I wasn't the best or biggest partier, just cause I wrote about it with my own name. I kind of right. got to be the, the brand for that for a while. And so many people are like, like amazed by my transition. And it's like, it's not that amazing to me because it's my life, right? It's like, okay, well, I, yeah, I had to do some things and they were hard. But I think a lot of people, it's funny, you just said it. Uh, like our lives are up to us and we can write our own story. Bro, I think about 5% of the people get that. Mm. Truly, maybe less, maybe 3% or two. Like actually, I'm totally in agreement with you. You and I are both successful, I think, because we think that way and we mm. do that. Very few people get that. 
And that concept, I think, it's one of those things, you know how like, uh, I'm sure you've seen this in your life. The things that you're awesome at just seem super obvious to you. Yeah, and you yeah. can't understand why other people don't see it. Sure, yeah. It, That's why great all, baseball players don't make good coaches. Like Ted Williams tried to be a heading coach for the Red Sox after he retired. He was just like, just hit the ball, man. What are you doing? <laughs> What's wrong with yeah. you? Look at it and hit it. Like, right. Calm down, well, dude. <laughs> it's, the same, dude it's the same thing. Uh, it's taken me almost a whole decade to come back around and realize things that I think are obvious and easy are not always obvious and easy to a lot of other people. Mm. And so the best thing I can offer other people not kind of, I'm not talking about my family or my wife or even my direct community, but out the, the best thing I have to offer people outside of that are me talking honestly about what I did to go through that transition. Yeah. That's it. Or here's the four steps. I did here and here's how I did it. And that's it. Yeah. It's a good, uh, it's, it's like, you know, the purpose, the, the ultimate purpose of leadership is to create new leaders. That's my opinion. Uh, as yes. somebody who's served in leadership roles at the, at the, in the most extreme circumstances, like the most effective you'll ever be as a leader is to create other leaders around you. You know what I mean? So if you want to, if, if you want convenience in your life, if you want more safety security, if you're trying to check things off Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the best thing you can do after becoming, uh, you know, somewhat self-sufficient is to start creating more self-sufficient people around you because that individual liberty and entrepreneurship is the ultimate inoculation to tyrannical bullshit. It's the only thing that ever will ever work in any kind of scale. I totally agree. And I think the only way to help other people, I don't think you can tell them what to do. I think you can tell them what you did mm. and that can help them figure out their own path. So teach them how to think and not what to think. I mean, that's obvious, right? It should be obvious to us at this and, point. You know, so it, it, yeah, I think it's a step beyond that. Mm. Definitely not telling people what to think. Like you can do that and you can create a cult or whatever. Um, I'm not even sure you can t teach people how to think. Mm. Uh, uh, in a direct way. Uh, what I'm talking about, the things that have helped me the most um, are when I have, when someone has been super honest about their life and what they went through and what that does is it opens a space, it gives me the tool to reflect honestly on my life, mm. right? Whereas like, uh, think about it. Like if, if I'm like, Here's what you need to do. Step one, step two, step three. It's like, okay, dude, you really like, may, maybe it's useful. Mm -hmm. If I asked you, you know, or if you asked me a specific thing, how do I get to your house? Okay, here's the three steps. All right, fine. But like, if you're, you know, trying to solve a problem in your life, a checklist, okay, maybe. Or uh, w what's better, that or someone saying, well, when I had that problem, here's what I did. Well, what you're describing is a word problem in mathematics. If you want somebody to truly understand something, you don't just give them mechanics. You give them an example and let them work out the example in their own head because theater of the mind will take over and they'll start to create their own examples and it'll make sense to them, right? That's the reason we do it that way. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, the, I, I get this in feedback all the time mm. too. The pieces I write where I tell people, here's exactly how to do it, you know, they're fine. They're like, they, get, they do decent. Everything I do that blows up and the people like gushingly thank me for is when I tell people what I did mm. and, and why I did it this way, how I thought, you know, because it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's mm. that like, I, I, I think as humans, it's very hard for us to know ourselves directly. And that one, sometimes the best and easiest way to know ourselves is through reflection of someone else. Sure, yeah. Uh, because that someone else being open and honest is so compelling that it, it it helps us, it forces us, but also helps us to ask ourselves those same questions and to look at ourselves. Oh, they're so courageous. Okay, I can be courageous too. How, what, what would I do in that situation? Here's how, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so like, what I'm trying to do with my stuff is honestly, is just tell my, keep telling my story in the most honest way possible. The difference is I used to tell my story and I used to only tell the funny parts in a funny way. I'm gonna try and keep that as much as possible, although I'm not really as funny as I was then. Um, uh, you know, because I've done so much emotional work, like, you know, humor for the most part is a way to cover up pain. Oh yeah. I've 
dealt with a lot of my pain, so a lot of my humor's gone. <laughs> Not all of it, but a lot of it. It's like, on one hand, it's like I feel so much better, but it's kind of sad. It's like, man, I used to be so much funnier. Um, but uh, but the it, it's it, it, now to tell the whole story. Like, here's okay, here's. Here's all the parts, at least, that are going to be, you know, interesting, not just the funny, entertaining parts. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, uh, and I appreciate it, too. As somebody who's, you know, trying to do something of the same thing, it's, uh, you know, many hands make light work, I guess, is a phrase that I always think of. And when I see a bunch of people crowded around the middle of the room bitching and complaining and, you know, a couple of people on the outer edge holding the walls up, it makes me really angry. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. Anger has, uh, uh, some utility, but in this situation, the effort is the way to overcome it, not rage. So, uh, I like to tell people you can inhale, uh, if you can inhale your anger and exhale purpose, then you can, you know, you can really do something and you're, you're out there doing it. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. What's, what's the name of the show, by the way, so people can go look it up. Uh, just go to tuckermax.com. Okay. It's everything in there. Sweet. Well, look, I appreciate you coming today, man. It's been a really interesting conversation, as always. Yes, yes. Thank you, man. Of course. Yeah, Anytime. good. And have fun on the uh, have fun on the farm today. Yeah, I will. I got more wood to split. <laughs> I'm I sure. Got, like, I actually love doing that. I used to do that. That was like the most. It, it was some weird combination of calming and purposeful, like yeah. maybe nothing I've ever done in my life, to be honest. But anyways, yeah, yeah have fun doing that. I appreciate you coming today. And uh, appreciate you all for listening. This has been Citizen.